Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of the Strength Coach Roundtable hosted on Row Perfect UK. My name is Will Ruth, uh, strength coach and author of the Row Perfect UK ebook, Rowing Stronger. And today I'm not joined by co hosts Blake Gourlay and Joe DeLeo. I'm joined by coach Tara Morgan of Seize the Oar Unified Rowing in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Blake and Joe are on a hiatus for a couple months, so I'm going to be running a couple of different format episodes, bringing on a few different guests. Uh, and today, Tara and I are going to talk about strength training for adaptive rowers. Welcome, Tara. Hey, Will. Thanks for having me. So I'm Coach Tara, and I run an organization called Seize the Oar, which is based in Seattle, Washington. We do inclusive rowing in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, most notably, we do competitive rowing for para uh, athletes. So my background is I've been a rower since I was 13 years old, uh, off and on. I, I row now for a team called Counterbear Rowing Club, one of the oldest women's master's teams in the country. Uh, I coach Learn to Row for uh, Boathouse in Seattle, and then I started Seize the Oar five years ago. I started Seize the Oar because uh, we got an email, or I got an email from an athlete who was looking to learn to row, but he was a paraplegic and had gotten no response from boathouses in Seattle. So I jumped on it. I thought, that's pretty cool. I was already a personal trainer, and I thought, what a great uh, opportunity to pick apart rowing, my favorite sport, and get somebody on the water who may not get that opportunity. So that's how we started. As so what kind of um, audiences sees the or for? So CZOR is, when we look at the word adaptive, uh, I think that I want to define adaptive in this scenario as anyone who wants to row but needs some adaptation. So what do we need to do to get that person on the water? And our primary audiences are, uh, and our primary clients and, and rowers are people with disabilities, um, disabilities you might see as a more visible disability, for instance, someone who uses a wheelchair, or someone who uses crutches, or someone who uses a walking stick. Um, and we also work with athletes who are coming back from an injury because it's the same mentality, it's the same methodology. It's someone who loves to row, who needs adaptation to be able to do that, and we have all sorts of gadgets and tools and technology and uh, methodologies to do that. And I love so. I mean, your kind of attitude is sure. Let's try it. So that kind of says that. Um, and I've gone down last summer. I went to go work with Seize the War Rowing and got to actually um, help get some of your clients on the water. It was really cool just to see that um, people of all different types being able to experience rowing kind of through that attitude of if you want to row, let's figure out a way to do it. Right. I think from the very beginning, I've always really valued inclusiveness in the sport. And that's why I'm a learn to row coach. I see people from all walks of life coming to learn to row from 80 years old to someone who might be having some weight issues or going through a tough time in their lives. And I love rowing so much in that it can um, be molded and adapted to meet those people's personal goals, their physical goals, um, their revealing about parts of themselves that they may never have seen before. You often see people in all of aspects of rowing finding out that they're an athlete, mm -hmm. finding out that they're competitive, that they have a competitive streak. Um, finding you out- can row, You row doubles, you row, I, mean, I know you've got the barge. I mean, you can kind of get any number of people out of the water that you want to. Right, but I think what's unique about CCR is that um, we only row two person boats or larger. We don't do singles. Mm -hmm. Um, and the main reason for that is to really keep encouraging that, sure, let's try it, let's figure it out, let's work through um, the different nuances of rowing, whether it's weather related or it's personality conflicts in a boat. These are life skills, you know, these are skills that'll make you win and make you stronger and more competitive and ultimately a better rower. So we do a program that's doubles. Uh, we do use the barge when we have folks um, coming in uh, who can row with their legs uh, with their lower bodies um, but yeah the let's yes let's try it has been from the beginning mm -hmm. it's like sure why not let's try it and so I guess on that same vein or moving from that attitude when I pitched this podcast idea to Tara I kind of said you know hey what I want to do is get the conversation started on strength training for adaptive rowers it's not really there's not much material out there 
for that audience. There's not a lot of material out there for strength training for in the first place. That's why I started my website and online operation to start for this podcast. So my goal was just to really get some resources out there for the adaptive rower or the adaptive coach to just start being able to branch into this side of the training for the sport. Sure. Um, so I'm glad to have you on for your expertise to talk not only about what's important for performance, but also what's important for injuries, injury risk reduction, um, and, and how to actually make some of those adjustments and accommodations for uh, the individual athlete. So um, what we'll kind of do, I, I joked before this that my job was kind of done just by turning over the platform to you. So um, I'm going to kind of guide this conversation, but for the most part, this is going to be um, Tara talking about your experience um, running with the winter training program that you've just coming off of now. Great. Awesome. So one note is that um, when we further define adaptive, when you look at adaptive, say at the Paralympic level, um, the FISA qualifications for people, uh, they break them down into three classifications. So assuming that we are talking today to coaches and rowers who are working in these populations, I just want to clarify what that means. Uh, so there are three categories in FISA for adaptive and para rowing, and they are the LTA category, which stands for legs, trunk, and arms. That's now called PR3, uh, if you see that listed anywhere on a regatta. Presumably PR for para rowing, right? Para rowing level okay. three, yeah. right. Uh, the next level is TA, which stand, stood for trunk and arms, and that's PR2. And then we have arms and shoulders, which is PR1. Athletes can self-identify into these categories. As a coach, you may have an athlete who doesn't necessarily want to go to the Paralympics, doesn't necessarily feel or have an opportunity to get classified, which is a long process involving um, doctors and forms and travel to various uh, locations because there are very few classifiers, especially on the West Coast, and these have to be specifically trained individuals. So in our case in CZUR, we're primarily athletes who are not interested in that level of rowing, but we are interested in competition. Mm -hmm. So we do classify our athletes um, based on what we see. Uh, we have all three in our club. And what we do is we basically operate out of three tenants when we build our strength training programs. We train year round. Uh, we're on the water for uh, from May through November, and then we're indoors from November through the end of April. Uh, and what we operate on in terms of like a needs analysis or how we develop the programs is we always operate out of three tenants. We try to work out of heal, protect, perform. And that may sound really familiar to the strength training programs you do mm -hmm. with your athletes or any coach does with any rowing athletes. It's not specific to adaptive. Um, but in terms of the, the tenets of heal, protect, perform, you as a coach and you as a rower, you need to know where you thrive and you need to know your body and know where you need some work and where you really can be outstanding as a coach. It's something you need to understand in terms of where your expertise lies and then where you need to delegate. A lot of the challenges of being a coach of adaptive rowing is basically ignorance about different uh, conditions, contraindications, uh, medication, uh, in how they don't match up with exercise. And we'll get into that later, the, the challenges of safety and, and injury. And I mean, there's enough to do for a rowing coach anyway between the training program, the rigging, the athletes, the lineups, the travel, the regattas, and then you add strength training onto that. And now you add on all the other adaptive stuff and the knowledge that you have to have to be able to do that. So, right. so it's, my, a huge, it's a huge topic. Yeah, so my message to coaches who are listening to this would be to say that this conversation is hopefully the beginning of something really great in terms of developing more materials and more conversation around um, adaptive rowing and strength training for competitive athletes like this. Um, and she's your definitely wants to be a resource for you. So we'll provide some information at the end of the show about how to get in touch with us and what we can offer in terms of that to the rowers, your job, just like any rower is to know your body and then challenge it and push it um, and be really clear one thing that we do, I wanted to mention, is when an athlete comes into our program, we have uh, what's called our athlete questionnaire. And the athlete questionnaire basically helps a coach understand, 
let's say someone who has um, quadriplegia helps a coach understand what that injury is, how long you've had it, what kind of assistance you need in terms of uh, transfer or uh, bathroom assistance or transportation to get to practice. It also asks about medications and then it really puts the onus on the athlete to be really upfront about, about things. And again, we'll get into some more specific concerns when it comes to athletes, especially those with paraplegia. Well, and I think that's brilliant because you don't want to find those things out when you're already on the water. Absolutely right? so, not. I mean, that's, a, that's a necessary first step for really any program, but right. especially for an adaptive program to know what, what you're dealing right. with. Basically. And, and, you know, this is all really basic stuff as, as strength and conditioning coaches. Um, first tenant is always make sure that you're ready to do the work. Mm -hmm. Right. And that a lot, a lot of times falls to the athlete. Um, and just like any athlete, seniors, masters, juniors, um, there's always a little level of uh, intimacy when it comes to sharing um, personal mm -hmm. and chronic um, challenges that people have. But you really don't want to find out on the water that someone has asthma, mm -hmm. which has happened to me <laughs> two or three times, yep. both in a master's uh, learn to row scenario or someone saying, by the way, I don't have any cartilage in my right knee. That's why I get in the boat that way. And you're like, you needed to tell me that. Um, so this athlete questionnaire really uh, is a great document. And um, at the end of the show, we'll we'll provide some links and things. I'm happy to post our athlete questionnaire. So, so let's get into performance. So yeah. what, what are we looking at as far as uh, I got to at one of the regattas that I was at with you. I brought a couple of my Western rowers up and we all got to try to put up a uh, was it a 250 meter time or a minute for meters time on one of the fixed seats? Mm -hmm. And we're just blown away at, at how different and difficult it was to row uh, arms and shoulders only. Um, so the fixed seat, obviously your, your legs are secured. You've got the strap across your trunk. So all you're using is arms and shoulders. Uh, and it was just exhausting after about a minute. So I'm going to have to think that the performance needs are maybe a little bit different. So what, what kinds of things are you looking at there? Yeah, so one of the t uh, phrases that you hear a lot in rowing from coaches, and you've probably said this yourself, is only use what's necessary, right? So mm -hmm. if you see a rower scrunching up their face yeah. and screaming and grunting, that's not necessary. Wasted movement. It's yeah. wasted movement. We all can agree that that, uh, you know, you're clenching your hands too tight, you're shrugging your shoulders, you're um, you know, holding your breath, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things, they're not going to fly in rowing in this repetitive um, kind of sport. So with the fixed seat training in specific, now we're talking about people who are PR2 or PR1, which is the TA or the AS. They sit on a fixed seat. Uh, there's a strapping involved, uh, which takes a lot of finagling. You asked my athletes on the team. I remember. Yep. <laughs> lots and lots of finagling, and you know, because you really don't want to get friction sores and pressure sores. Um, but the training to that, if you think about uh, someone who uses a wheelchair all day long, they are doing one motion forward. So I don't know how you would describe what I'm doing. I'm, I'm pushing wheels forward. You've all yeah. seen people with uh, using wheelchairs. So rowing, which is one of my favorite stories about Seas the Oar, was a, a new rower who came to us and got on the erg for the first time. And she pulled back two or three strokes and just broke into this huge grin and said, it's like an itch I couldn't scratch. Because you don't the, ever get to pull. They don't have, really. Yeah, the, yeah. the effort of pulling back was sure. so powerful. Sure. So it's the same. It's the same idea. Use what's necessary. Um, but I think as an adaptive rowing coach, what I've had to contend with is I can't teach rowing like I would to a fully able-bodied individual to these rowers, um, not these rowers, my rowers on the team, because they're gonna have to use their traps. They're gonna have to use their neck and their head to create momentum. Mm -hmm. It's all within reason, but it requires a coach to be creative, innovative, and also looking a little outside the box. The conventional stroke doctrine doesn't Thank necessarily you. apply. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I can't tell you how many times I've been out on the water with a, a run, another rowing coach, and they're telling me that, oh, they're the the catch needs to be this way mm -hmm. or the rigging needs to be this way. And I, I backtrack and I say, okay, well, let's try it and see. And I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I'm always like a sure, let's, sure, try, let's it. try it. Right. 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 <laughs> That's kind of the thing. And, uh, and I remember days where I've had to literally twist my brain backwards to say, let that go. Yeah. Let that conventional stroke yeah. go. Oh, and you're see. rolling. Like if you're, if you're, 
PR one, you're rowing at what fifty five strokes a minute. Uh, I mean, the, they race at uh, close to thirty six. Thirty six. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. About, about thirty. I mean, it's still it's still high, and it's very short turnover, and the the upper body peak forces are obviously very high, so it's a different stroke than it is. Right. And you've got two people going at the same time, mm -hmm. and it's sculling, so it's light, and mm -hmm. you've got uh, seats and uh, seating and rigging that is so archaic and so counter to fast light effective. Fortunately, there's a lot of changes coming down the line, namely by Seize the Oar and by some work back east to create equipment and things that'll make rigging and make boats lighter. Um, it's, a big, it's a big deal. But when we train them, strength and training wise, we're trying to mimic the rowing motion and we're trying to do a couple things. So we're focusing on developing power we're focusing on emphasizing rhythm and we're also in trying to increase range of motion, right? Or trying to flu make it more fluid, mm -hmm. the range of motion, um, because it is going the opposite direction, mm -hmm. for, especially for the paraplegic rowers or the para rowers who use wheelchairs. Um, it is going the opposite way. I'll say that the folks on our team are a range of paraplegic, quadriplegic, uh, traumatic brain injury, visual impairment. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, when we go back to those three areas of the LTA, the TA, and the AS, you know, um, that's when we design our workouts, we design them for everyone, right? So the movements that they do, everyone on the team does them to develop their power, to emphasize rhythm of rowing, and to increase the range of motion, which is pretty standard mm -hmm. kind of strength training mm -hmm. principles, right? And it's nice to have kind of an overarching program philosophy to then be able to build under that. Absolutely. We design our workouts every week the exact same way. The board looks exactly the same. Everyone knows where they're supposed to look on the board. Um, we build stations. We do, um, it, the board is usually split into an LTA or PR3 workout and an ASTA workout, which the ASTA workouts can be a little closer together mm. um, depending, on, depending on the athlete. Um, and just like a, a workout that we would do anywhere uh, in terms of strength training, we break it into a cardio component, a strength component, and a recovery component. Sometimes the recovery component is that they go home and, you know, they take a bath or we tell them to go um, you know, lay on the floor and do some stretches and give them specific things to do. Sometimes people just have to jet out. And we know from rowers that no one likes to sit around and, and stretch. Mm -hmm. um, but we always are emphasizing a, a recovery Component. So those cardio component and strength component are in every workout. Um, and I think what's unique to rowing, we talked about this a little bit, is there is a mental game that goes into being on a team. There's a mental game that goes into doing a repetitive motion over and over and over and over and over again, where conditions are maybe unfavorable uh, in terms of nature being a part. Uh, so one thing that we try to teach is a is a way to deal mentally with repetitive, 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 repetitive kind of um, activities. So we build our workouts kind of on those tenets. Cool. Yeah. And so that's kind of the, the perform bucket. We'll come back to session design and talk some more specifics as far as how all this exactly comes together. Um, but if you want to go into the, the protect bucket next, as far as what are you looking at as far as um, minimizing ri risk of injuries? Yeah, so we do a couple of things when we design the workouts. First and foremost, we have staff. And I know this is crazy. Most adaptive rowing programs are real, real small clubs, don't have the luxury of staff. So my recommendation for that would be don't design an overly complicated workout. Sure. <laughs> so let's keep it stay, really simple. Stay within your means. Stay yeah. within your means. And by that, I mean, you need to have eyes on everybody, just like you would anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so having eyes on everybody, having people staffing certain stations uh, when we do, for instance, med ball slams, uh, reaching down and picking up a, a med ball, 14 pound med ball off the floor may not be a best use of our time. It's also not part of the workout. So we actually hand it back to them. What yeah. is your what is your um, coach to athlete ratio or your staff to athlete ratio? Uh, usually uh, one to three. So one okay. coach to three athletes, and we usually have anywhere from eight to twelve athletes at a practice. Okay. So and and again along the range of LTA, TA, AS. Yeah. Um, so having staff there, one really key component. And when I actually surveyed the athletes when I saw them on Sunday for our workout, I said, "What do you want me to talk about? What's really been important mm -hmm. to you?" 
um, they said to me, do not suggest AMRAP, which if you don't know the, the acronym AMRAP, it means as many reps as possible. And it's a type of workout that's made popular by CrossFit type of uh, folks and circuit. It's a very circuit style workout. Basically get this many reps in X amount of time. Or, yeah, or, like, get, or you get have as many reps as you can in 30 seconds. Yeah, minute, whatever, you have 30 minute. seconds. How many reps can you get? And it creates uh, an environment of kind of frenzied yeah. activity. And because if, you're rewarding the reps over the quality. Right, right. 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 Yeah. Pe beautifully said, yes. Yeah. Rewarding the reps over the quality. So we always do a HIT style workout where we mix high cardio moves with strength training moves. Uh, so hit a high intensity, high interval. intensity yeah. interval workouts. Yeah, we do those types of workouts, but we always give us, or we try to give a specific number of reps. And is that like a range? So you'd say, okay, twelve to fifteen here, or or would you prescribe the exact number? We would do probably a range. We would probably say, uh, you know, in the workout that we did last week, um, you know, eight to ten mm -hmm. reps is probably pretty pretty uh typical and so that allows the athlete to to push themselves without sacrificing movement quality sure and we also do the one rep max type of workout or the three rep max type of workouts if you're not familiar with that um you might give an athlete three activities or three tasks to do a med ball slam or sorry not a med ball slam but like a a, a curl to press mm -hmm. with a kettlebell a um, overhead press those types of things, and you would say, do the weight has to be heavy enough that you can only do three reps? Would that be a good way to explain yeah, three yeah, reps? Yeah, you're max? giving them a target, a target rep range to hit, and they take usually some amount of jumps to hit up to that point. Right. Yeah. So at three rep max, it would be a pretty heavy weight and be a pretty tough three and reps. What, what I'll often do too is I'll set technical failure rather than muscular failure. So I'll say, okay, yeah, three reps perfect. so that you couldn't do a fourth while still maintaining movement quality. Right. So the reason for those staff people, which is great, a great segue to that, the reason for the staff people is um, is spotting. It really sure, is yeah. spotting. It's uh, providing encouragement. It's providing a pair of eyes for me. Um, you know, with 12 to 18 athletes at any one uh, workout, obviously I can't um, take care of that. And you've always got some beginners and some people who haven't spent time in the gym. And then you've got folks who um, may just be, like I said, novices in the gym. And then you got some people who might be a little glory days, mm -hmm. right? Sure. You got the folks oh, who I are like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah you yeah. know, but they're thinking back to when they were in high school, yeah, sure. you know, or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I used to do all this, I used to squat this much. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, so that's kind of the protect is, is what we, we do to mi minimize risk of injury. Right. So it's, as the, far as so it's the design mm -hmm. of the workout, what type of workout you're mm -hmm. doing, how many, what kind of reps you're doing, whether it's like a three rep max, one rep max or hit or and not doing AMRAP, mm -hmm. staying away from that, um, having staff to be on site mm -hmm. with it and being super technical. One thing uh, we like to do is at the beginning of the workout, we actually role model the move. Mm -hmm. We say, okay, look give them at a visual example. Yeah, of what we give, for, yeah. Yeah, because we don't have a, we use a CrossFit facility. Um, so we don't have posters and, and signs, you know, and, and like on, at a gym where they have the little diagram of the guy doing the move, mm -hmm. you know, on the little machine. Um, we don't have that kind of setup. We love being in a CrossFit box, though, just as a side note. If you're looking for a place to set up your, your strength training for your team, any place that is wide, I like to call it wide open True. and modular. No, no narrow corridors and machines or anything. Modular. Like, yeah, if, yeah. if you could push every piece of equipment to the walls and have a giant open space in the middle. That is the best possible location for you. So if you're looking for a location to do this, um, we can give you some ideas uh, of places to look and go that already has a gym equipment, number one, so you don't have to buy a bunch of stuff. And number two, who just wants to partner with you and have a really cool partnership. Mm -hmm. We're really lucky. We're at CrossFit Columbia City, CrossFit RE, stands for Rugged Elite. And we're really lucky that we're in that facility because it is modular and it is really big. So mm -hmm. just a side note about if you're looking for a space to do this and going to a place like the Y may There's not be, narrow, yeah. it, it might be a little hard to navigate, especially if you have six to eight wheelchair yeah. uh, athletes. Okay. And so one thing I'm interested in is maybe you include this in the heel bucket rather than the protect bucket, but do you do specific 
uh, exercises or specific work to kind of offset the wheelchair use? Yes. What what bucket would you put that in and, and what kind of stuff do you do for that? I think that that would be in the, it's kind of heel kind of protect because. So we'll use it as a segue then. <laughs> right, no, it's great. The protection is coaches, athletes, everyone involved in doing this. If you get injured in your hands, in your elbows, in your shoulders, and you have a crutch user or a wheelchair user, you're really setting them back in a For lot life, of ways. Not just now, and maybe yeah, yeah. maybe permanently, but but more likely they got to be able to get on the bus and go home sure. and get dressed and do their thing. Um, I've often heard it said that the first rule of being a strength coach is do no harm. Do no harm, exactly. So that's where this is a little bit different than you might see in a traditional training gym in that there's a little bit more, and, and we all know that rowing, a big part of rowing is suffering beyond our comfort zone. Um, it's a big part of it. It's why we all have PTs and chiropractors and acupuncturists because um, we love the sport, but it, is, it does, it's very demanding. Um, but we never want to be in a position where we're putting someone at risk. So risky spots on rowers, especially um, folks who uh, I keep coming back to the to the wheelchair users, but I gotta say we serve all all kinds. Uh, sure, if you're of working folks. with someone with a visual impairment, then sure. you're talking about making sure that they're not running into things in the gym or guiding them right. around obstacles. Balance is balance. a big one. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So when we work also with Parkinson's, we do a lot of. Uh, neurological and even cognitive uh, work. Mm -hmm. So the heel protect um, mechanisms that we have are antagonistic moves to what they do all day, like shoulder opening. One of our favorite things that we do right now are wall angels, right? So everybody's kind of maybe seen a wall angel. What you do is you just back up to a wall, put your arms in a touchdown mm -hmm. T cactus, wherever you're from, you know, <laughs> <laughs> touchdown goalposts. Maybe that's it. Yep. And you just drag those hands up the wall and make basically snow angels. You know, you're just up and down the wall. I've also seen it called a scapular wall slide. And we'll, we'll post videos to all yeah. this stuff afterwards, too. We found that this one and a couple of other shoulder specific uh, antagonistic moves, mm -hmm. what's going to have them going the opposite way? Mm -hmm. what, how are we strengthening the back of the shoulder? Mm -hmm. How are we not, how are we lengthening the pecs? Mm -hmm. How are we. Uh, strengthening the hands. One strength coach who actually does work with athletes who use wheelchairs up in Canada, uh, I believe his name is Ramsbottom. We had a really lovely conversation and he said one thing to be cognizant of with uh, working with adaptive athletes is that they have spent, it's likely that your athletes have spent an enormous amount of time in rehab, in rehabilitation environments. Sure. And the word rehabilitation is not real sexy. Sure. It's pretty clinical. Right. So when he said one uh, thing that he does is he talks about hand performance, not hand rehab or hand okay. therapy. Like therapy is another no, no, mm -hmm. you know, like those are just words that trigger, you know, you just want to stay away from that. Plus you are talking Re about performance. Yeah. So what can we do to strengthen their hands for hand performance to be able to hold the oar feather, literally think about rowing 38 strokes a minute, and just how much feathering that is, mm -hmm. not using your legs and the timing. I did a 5K race <laughs> with arms and shoulders. And I think we ended up at, yeah, we, re we rode 5K. And I, uh, they call it pumped up I'm sure, your yeah. forearms. Yeah. yeah. I could not even imagine doing yeah. that, you know, all the time. It's, it's crazy. So how can we make their hands perform better? Mm -hmm. And again, that's antagonistic stuff. Mm -hmm. Hand flexion, you know, uh, extension and flexion stuff squeezing and, and lengthening, squeezing and lengthening, figuring out where they're using unnecessary uh, muscles. Are they gripping the hell out of those blades? Mm -hmm. Are they getting blisters? We all know as rowing coaches, those are signs of, of you know, those major boo-boos are, are signs of something not going right. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so we do some antagonistic stuff, the wall angels, hand performance, grasping and clasping, uh, using... Uh, squeeze balls or uh, uh, TRX type stuff because mm -hmm. holding onto a TRX handle, which is a, a strap strength yeah. training yeah. system. Portable. Suspension trainer. Suspension yeah. trainer, yeah. yeah. Um, also, we just brought in the uh, the ski erg. Mm -hmm. So the ski erg's got 
it's a little bit uh, it's somewhere halfway in between an erg stroke and a wheelchair yeah, sure. stroke, right? Yeah. It's kind of up and More down. Of a vertical component, yeah, yeah, so check that out from Concept2, the ski yeah. erg. It's a huge hit. So that's more of how we do the healing and protecting as we um, try antagonistic moves, and then we stay really sport specific, otherwise for performance. Sure. So, and it just helps them stay healthier on the water, where the conditions are not going to be as con controlled as they are right. sitting in a gym. Right. Right. You've got waves and water and crabby person in the bow, or <laughs> you know, you don't like the coach that day, yeah. or you know, stayed up too late yep. watching TV or something. Yeah. Uh, so those are kind of our three, the three buckets. And I guess from there, we'll go kind of funnel system. We've got our overarching kind of program philosophy and then into the specific workout design. Um, I know you, you've mentioned med balls and some of the body weight movements, but what other kind of um, modalities do you use in the gym? And what sure. are some more specifics of how you actually design a session? Yeah, so we do the cardio component and the strength component. Um, for the cardio component, we like to use the rowing machines um, for some interval work. And that's often, uh, for some folks, that's their warm up. They go into the strength training component, and then they, we always end. Uh, our sessions are 90 minutes long, it's a pretty hefty time. And um, how many times a week? Uh, we get together once a week, but we give them a training plan. They need to be working out three to four times a week. Okay. Yeah. So they get a training plan to go home. And again, that's one of the things that we can email a, a, or send out a, a sample of to you as a coach or as an athlete. Um, <clears throat> so the workouts, uh, also one of the things that we really, really need to have, and I'm sorry I didn't say this before in terms of the heel protect is a dynamic warm up. Mm -hmm. We're, really fortunate in that we have had very little injury on our team very very little no career-ending injuries definitely just little boo-boos and little strains here and there uh, a lot of rib strains stuff like that so what we do is a dynamic warm-up and i can demonstrate this um, on the video component um, that was actually brought to us by uh, a pt who came down and worked with us and she designed this um, dynamic warm-up which how would you describe a dynamic warm-up it's Combination of things, um, you aim to, to kind of elevate heart rate to raise core temperature, get blood pumping basically, and then movement prep, um, muscular activation kind of stuff to prepare them for the session. Yeah, so it's uh, it's something that they can do as a group. It's also a way that they can get to know each other and mm -hmm. they can one can lead. Sure. Um, we do a lot of team building type things like that. Uh, we put someone in charge as the captain of the workout, for instance. Um, then they move into uh, the cardio component or the strength training component. So here's a side note about equipment is that at CCR, we're really fortunate in that we have 12 ergs and seats, fixed seats for folks and enough ergs usually to go around. Um, but in your case, you may have to do a cycle. So think about a really defined strength training component and a really defined uh, erg or cardio component because with adaptive rowers, especially the ones who use the fixed seats, transfers from one activity to the next will take a little bit longer than, than you expect, right? So getting someone on an erg and off an erg. So has the dog there making an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy. Um, what we noticed in designing our workouts was we needed to allow for a lot of time for the transitions from the chair to the erg, from the erg back to the floor. So we don't do a lot of back and forth. Sure. We really make it defined. Like, okay, you're group A and you're on cardio and you're group B and you hope that your design makes it so that the cardio people can still have enough gas to do the strength and the mm -hmm. strength people can have enough gas to do the cardio, mm -hmm. right? So you have to consider that. Yeah, finding the balance there between that. Right, and when you look at the workout on the board, take a step back and say, what would this be like for me to do? Do you, do you ever try the workouts yourself on a fixed seat ahead of time? Uh, yeah. 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 It's deadly. <laughs> it's deadly. I'm like, dang, I'm going to work them hard today. Yep. Right. Uh, I actually just started training with them on uh, a couple of them Sweet. once a week. And it's really been interesting. We all did the hour of power mm -hmm. together. Yeah. So, so you're looking at your workout. You've got a cardio component. Uh, one thing that we love to do is the ski erg, which I mentioned, which is a great machine from um, Concept2. 
it mimics uh, kind of cross country ski, uh, downhill. I guess it wouldn't be downhill, but it'd be. Uh, no, it'd be cross country. Yeah, yeah. cross country. Uh, the ergometer, obviously. But then there's stuff that they can do if you don't have those machines. There's stuff that you can do uh, like boxing, hand cycle, mm -hmm. uh, some machines that are already out there and some uh, modalities that are already out there. Um, so we've done dynamic warm up, cardio component strength training wise. So now we're getting into strength training. So some of the, the gadgets and tools that we use for the strength training um, are uh, rubber bands, which are usually a loop mm -hmm. band. And some of them are a two ended uh, band that have handles on each end. And not the rubber band like you'd find at a, at a grocery store with like a resistance band. A resistance long, band, right? That's different resistances. Yeah, different yeah. colors or different resistances, yeah. black, red, green, yellow, blue. We use those bands quite a bit. Um, because we can regulate the resistance mm -hmm. and people can work up or work down. I use them a lot in my training too. Right. Um, and the kinds of exercises we might do with that uh, we'll demonstrate in gym because it's kind of hard to explain on, on, yeah. on the air. So we'll just yeah. keep going with the gadgets. So the other gadget <laughs> we like to use is, is med balls. Uh, and med balls can vary in size uh, and in weight, obviously. Some of them are, are big, black, 14 pound or various weight balls that you have to wrap both arms around to get your arms around. And then there's a series of med balls that you can get that are more um, volleyball size, even smaller mm -hmm. than that. And, and so you'll do, you'll do throwing exercises with those. We'll do passing okay. side to side passing with a partner core, core work. Is that absolutely that's that the core okay. work. Yeah. And again, back to your athletes, knowing their bodies, you know, lateral control can sure. be a real challenge. If you're um, so used to going front and back, right? Yeah. So and we like especially to have rowing them, too. That's all you do is anterior, posterior. Exactly. So having them rotate side to side is just going to help them sit up in the boat taller. Yeah, and that's true. true for any athlete. So we like to use the balls. We do slams. We do med ball tosses up to a wall. Mm -hmm. We do med ball passing to the side, to the right and to the left. And that's we, a great way too to develop explosivity which i imagine would often be underdeveloped if you're right yeah and all of these things when i was talking about our, our objectives emphasizing the rhythm of rowing we do uh often in order to maintain technique and to emphasize the rhythm we have them do it in uh, you know in our in my case it would be in 16 strokes a minute mm -hmm. or 18 strokes a minute there's a push Recover, recover, push, mm. recover, recover. Keep the same cadence. It's to, a cadence, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we really encourage them to do their workouts in that cadence. Mm. Um, we'll use kettlebells because I like them because they have a handle on them as opposed to a dumbbell. Uh, I like the kettlebells because it's more uh, sort of centrally weighted. Yeah, sure. And they'll do a, a curl to press with a kettlebell. They'll also do um, front in front of the face, almost like a goblet press. You know, uh, we'll demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. um, we use hand weights and small plates for shoulder performance uh, exercises. Like uh, there's one we call IYT, where you're actually holding weights in each hand and making eyes and then a Y and then a T. Uh, or they might do something called an eagle. So we'll, we'll sort of uh, give you some visuals on those. And then the benches. So when you're in a gym, uh, or box, you have benches and boxes, a really critical skill for rowing is how do they get in and out of the boat, right? True. This could make or break your practice. Yeah, this right. could set your practice back 20 minutes if someone is really struggling with their transfers. Um, at CCR, we actually have a minimum physical requirement. This is the only minimum physical requirement that we have is that you need to be able to transfer from your seat if you're in a wheelchair, using wheelchair, to the ground and back into your chair mm -hmm. by yourself. We're a hands-free, no touch, mm -hmm. no lift organization. That's kind of like a flip test for, for other programs. Right, right, right. Sure, yeah. yeah. So if you feel like your athletes, that that's an area where they need to improve, this is an opportunity within the strength training environment to do a very practical skill. Um, Using their wheelchairs also and the benches, um, we like to have them do press ups. So they put both hands down and they push themselves sure. out of their seat or they push themselves like a, like a triceps dip, basically. So a right? dip, yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. And then for your legs, trunk, and arms rowers, you have them do dips. So there's like a modified version and then there's a, 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 a non modified version of everything. Last week, we tried burpees. 
<laughs> yeah, we tried burpees. Come on, let's try it. Come on, let's try it. <laughs> we saw there's a great guy, and I'm going to give him a little shout out. Uh, he has a, a Instagram account called Adapt to Perform, and he is just gonzo. He, he's got some great ideas about ways to use machines in the gym. Um, you'll notice that he has a spotter with him mm -hmm. almost at all times. Um, and we saw a video, thanks to one of our athletes, of him doing uh, burpees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so crazy. It was we'll, great. We'll make sure to link that in the show notes too. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see it. Yeah, shout out to him. And also shout out to uh, Wheel Wad, which is a wheelchair uh, mm -hmm. CrossFit guy. He does some really interesting stuff. So, nice. so those are some of the tools that we use. Um, floor and body weight, obviously, uh, we're also using. Um, with our legs, trunk, and arms rowers, we'll do things like Statue of Liberties or Turkish get-ups. Mm -hmm. You might know them as. Um, but all these things are very rowing specific. They're rhythmic. Mm -hmm. They have an opportunity for um, expanding range of motion, developing rhythm, and developing power and explosive. And then using a bit of creativity to, to bridge the gap and make an accommodation or an adjustment when you need to. Right. And I think one of the challenges as a coach, and I think some of the coaches would, would agree with this, is that you can get real wrapped up in picking a part of an exercise to make it acceptable for one athlete. Right. So you just have to make time for that. That's just part of the job. Sure. Um, you know, you might have someone who has. Uh, no left pinky and no left bicep. That's one of our athletes. I don't know if it's her pinky, but she's missing a finger mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's missing half of her bicep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And she's also a really talented athlete. So we want to make sure she's protected as well as uh, served mm -hmm. best, you know, served best uh, intentions. And you try to do that before the session. So you're not coming up with it um, on the whiteboard beforehand. Or you know, you sometimes of... we never know as coaches who's going to show up. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that's kind of a beauty and a curse of it. But when they do show up, that's why we demonstrated at the beginning, because then the athletes one by one will come up to you and go, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And then what's really cool is when they get to a point in the exercises where they're like, I can't do this. Like, this is just my body doesn't like this. I don't I need I need something else to do this. And they'll dig into their own archives of their PT backgrounds mm, when sure. they had to go to rehab and PT. And they'll pull, I'll look over, and they have one athlete has three other athletes doing some really cool move that I've mm. never seen before that addresses shoulder impingement. Mm. And I'll be like, oh, let's write that down. Yeah. So, you know, use your athletes and their knowledge and what makes their bodies feel really strong and really good because, um, you know, there isn't, there isn't a whole lot of material on this, yeah. especially for performance training. Yeah. And there is so much of it that is individual and is down to – down to what you personally can yeah. do, so it makes sense yeah. to to use that as an advantage, not as a right. not as a disadvantage. But I think where where you can get a lot of uh, traction is keep it rowing specific. Yeah, you know, keep it to those three things: explosive power, off the drive, off the catch, uh, creating drive, um, rhythmic cadence of rowing, uh, and then range of motion because the the reach can be an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if they're doing that singular motion of pushing a wheelchair all day long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have an athlete on the team, Mike, who just crushes it with, uh, you know, 20 miles a day on the chair. Oh. And, you know, his hands are like, you know, <laughs> sure. concrete. You know, he's, he's so strong, though. He's so strong. And I think, uh, you know, making sure that, that we're addressing that kind of mileage and that kind of, you know, we know our athletes. So no, well, I think that comes back too to the, you've got the perform for the agonistic movement, right? You're a rowing, rowing specific. This is going to improve performance kind of moves, which is where the erg comes in too. Right. right. And then you've got your protect for what things you do at the, at the structural level, basically, and how you organize your sessions and how you design things. And you got your heel for developing the antagonists and they all three together build into performance short and long term make us fast yeah yeah well, i think fast. that's as good a place to leave as any if you have anything yeah. else to add let us know or where, where where can we find you online yeah so seize the or is on instagram at seize the or and facebook is the same hashtag uh, or hashtag uh what's it call it yeah, yeah whatever it is so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh url address no no whatever. no what's your facebook name anyway uh, seize the or uh, we'd love to have you join us on CCR. And then for the coaches in the room and, and the rowers, um, one thing that has been really fun is that CCR has found, uh, oh, across the country and across the world, you may have a club where there's one adaptive athlete and then one really great 
volunteer or coach that's working with that athlete. And that's pretty isolating. And one thing that we want to do is we want to make sure everybody gets connected. So we created the Ring of Fire Para Rowing Society. It's a private group on Facebook. What we try to do is collect uh, knowledge and encouragement and give each other heads up about great opportunities for camps, uh, like the ones that CZOR hosts, uh, camps, workshops, regattas that might uh, really be into having some adaptive added to it or adaptive emphasized at it. Um, we also figure out who's got what equipment, right? It's because equipment is kind of hard to come by. And then if you wanted to get 10 rowers together, how are you possibly going to get all those people in the water? So we share inventory. Um, but we also, more importantly, just share the journey of getting some fast racing happening in this country in para sure. rowing and building a community out of the right. sport. Yeah. Right. Cause CZOR is all about um, inclusion and competition. We have a, a catchphrase that we use. We say one catch, one finish, one team. And we're five years in and we hope that this year is our fastest year yet. Great. Great. Well, thanks so much for, for coming on and sharing your experience and awesome. expertise. Thank you. Um, we will, as always have the show notes available on uh, Rope Perfect UK afterwards. So make sure you look for that because we'll have all of the links and uh, video demonstrations as well as um, uh, how, how you can find Tara and more information about uh, her program. Um, and yep, thank you so much for joining the ninth episode of the Strength Coach Roundtable. See you next time. Go team. <laughs>